I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is a joy for us to be gathered in this place today, and uh, we want to thank God for his presence. Uh, God has promised that he will be present even unto the end of the age, and ours is to just stick with him. And so we are thankful that God has not left us alone. Regardless of what we go through, God continues to be present with us, and we can have this confidence that God is with us even as we go through these strange times. These are different and strange, unique times that we are going through, not only as a community, not only as a, a country, not only as a continent, but indeed as the entire world. We are going through strange times, and I know that God is present uh, with us through these times. We are facing a pandemic uh, around the world which has affected people in various ways. We ourselves are affected in some way or the other, but we thank God that his presence is not conditional. He continues uh, to be with us even at times like these. Uh, there are others who have been affected um, personally. They themselves have been infected uh, by this virus and they're going through the treatments and the, uh, the, the period of recovery. We continue to remember those in our prayers, even as we worship. Uh, we pray for those who, who are connected to those who are infected, the loved ones of the infected, the family members of the infected. They are going through a very uncertain time themselves. And so we want to remember them in a special way because you know viruses are no respecter of persons. And any time it could affect you or it could infect you or myself. And so this is not something that has affected people and we are, we are excluded from this whole thing. So we, we want to thank God that he is still present with us even as we go through these uh, strange times. And uh, as we get into our message today, as it is my custom, uh, I would like to invite you to just turn to your neighbor, if you don't mind being instructed by a screen. But just turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, it is good to be here. Neighbor, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to have church. Neighbor, the preacher needs your prayers, and the Lord needs your heart. Neighbor, the title of our message today is Fear and Faith at the Red Sea. Amen. That is what we want to look at today at a time like this because as we go through this season, and I call it a season because it will pass, but as we go through this season, many of us are filled with fear. We are apprehensive, we are anxious. Uh, we, we react to this pandemic uh, a lot of times in a, in a way of fear. So we want to address that this uh, in this service and talk about fear and faith at the Red Sea. May I invite you where you are to just bow your heads with me as we seek God in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful today because your presence is unquestionable. It is unequivocal. We know that you are here with us. We pray now as we go through your word that you will touch our minds Give us understanding of what will be spoken. May you touch my lips and let them move at the impulses of your love. Speak to us, Father, as only you can. Hide me behind Calvary and let Jesus alone be seen and heard today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to call your attention to the book of Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, and I will read from verse 10. Uh, and this is what the Bible says in the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, this is what the Word of God says. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, 
the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Many of us will be familiar with the background of this story. The children of Israel have gone through an experience. They have been in slavery for hundreds of years. And finally, God raises up a man by the name of Moses and prepares him in a special way for this assignment uh, to set God's people free from Egyptian bondage. Moses goes back uh, and treats the, the king, Pharaoh, and the ten plagues uh, begin to occur, at the end of which Pharaoh has had it and he, he, he does not want to see any more plagues. And he declares that the children of Israel can go. And as he makes this declaration, it is to him a way of getting rid of these people who, whom he regards as responsible for the plagues that have fallen upon Egypt. And as they go, Pharaoh has a change of mind. He begins to think, what shall we do now that this entire labor force has gone? Initially, their emancipation, rather this was supposed to be a, a temporary release for them to go and worship and come back. But as things unfolded, they were now being emancipated out of Egyptian slavery. And so as they go, the Bible tells us that Pharaoh got chariots. He got the best chariots in the nation. And with those chariots, he was now headed uh, to go and uh, reclaim his slaves back into Egypt. And so the Bible tells us that he made ready his chariot in Exodus 14, verse 6, going forward. In verse 7, it says that he took 600 chosen chariots. He didn't just pick up any old chariots. He, he, he got 600 of the best chosen chariots. Of course, it goes on to say that uh, he took all the chariots of Egypt and the captains, every one of them. Those, those chariots were so well made that two are said to, to survive from that period to present day. They've been preserved there in museums. But that is how well made they were. And Pharaoh pursues after the children of Israel. And finally, we come to the point, to the text that we read, where Pharaoh draws close to the children of Israel. The Bible says that the children of Israel lifted up their voice. They cried out unto the Lord. And I think that's an important thing, that when you are faced with uncertainty, faced with fear, you must call upon God. Do you know that a lot of people call upon God as a last resort? Not many people call upon God as a first resort. But I want to say to us today that whatever it is that we find ourselves in, let God be our first call. Let's not call him because your uncle has let you down and your father has let you down and that friend that you trusted has let you down or the people that you placed your confidence in have let you down. Pharaoh pursued these people on chariots. And you know what the Bible says about people who trust in chariots? Psalm 20 verse 7. It says that some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord. We will not trust in the things that everybody else is trusting in, but we will remember. When they are trusting, we are remembering. Remembering the Lord. That means remembering what God means to me, remembering how God has led me in the past, remembering how God can bring me out of any situation. So regardless of the situation, let God be the first call that we make. The Bible says that the children of Israel lifted up their voice. They called upon God. But it was not all of them who were calling upon God. 
as we look at verses 11 and 12. The Bible tells us that they said unto Moses. So you know, some of them called unto God, but some didn't call upon God, they called upon Moses. They had placed their trust in him. So they call upon Moses and the Bible says, they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken, away, taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. These people have seen the hand of God. They have seen the ten plagues. They have seen how the firstborn child of each family in Egypt was slain. They have seen that. They have seen how their own children were spared because of the blood. They have seen how the angel of death passed over. They have seen mighty works. Now they are in the wilderness. They see Pharaoh's army coming behind them. Now they turn against Moses and they are asking Moses, listen, was it because there were no graves in Egypt? Was that, was that a shortage? of graves in Egypt, that you decided that you would bring us out to the wilderness to die. Egypt, the land of tombs, the land of graves. And they are saying, was there a shortage of graves that you have decided to, 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 to extricate us out of Egypt so that we die out here in the wilderness? And then they don't only stop there, they said, listen, this is exactly what we were talking about. God, didn't we tell you? We told you that leave this thing alone. This venture will not work. We told you. Beloved, the blame game is not something new. The blame game did not begin with the children of Israel blaming Moses. The blame game goes right back to our first parents. When God comes back into the garden and asks Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam doesn't even answer the question. He doesn't tell God where he is. He says, God, this woman that you gave me. And God speaks to the woman and says, woman, why have you done this thing? And she says, God, the serpent that you have made. So the blame game is something that has come to us all the way from Eden. And they blame Moses. They make it his fault. And I, I don't know. If I had been Moses, I don't know. I would have been tempted to ask them, who forced you to come? Who forced you to come? You are now blaming me. You should have stayed. But Moses, it is said, he was the meekest man. And that's, this is an, an example of where his meekness was exemplified, where it was shown. Uh, because I, 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 you know, I, I think I would have given them a piece of my mind and they would not have liked it. I have brought you all this way. You have seen what God has done for you. And now you want to blame me. But listen to how Moses responds. After they accuse him, after they blame him, he does not respond to the accusation, he does not respond to the blame. Moses recognizes that what these people are saying is a symptom of fear. Moses understands that. And so as he responds to them, the Bible says in verse 13, and Moses said unto the people, fear not. Moses doesn't say, don't blame me. Moses doesn't say, I didn't force you to come out of Egypt. Moses does not address the things that they have said. But what he, he recognizes that, no, what they are saying is simply a manifestation of fear on the inside. And so he says, I recognize that you are scared. I recognize that you are afraid. So fear not. 
I have been told that the Bible throughout scripture is littered with that statement. I have been told that if you count the number of times that the Bible says, fear not, be thou not afraid, have no fear. If you count the number of times that you find that statement in scripture, it comes up to about 365 times. It is as though God understands that one of the biggest challenges of humanity is fear. We are scared. We are afraid. And God understands that we are afraid. And so he has given us a fear not for each day of the year and leap year like this year. So each year, each day has got a fear not that God has prescribed to his children. Have no fear. Be not afraid. Something that we must realize about fear is that fear sees. Okay? Fear sees. But faith also sees. Fear and faith at the Red Sea. Fear sees things that are not yet uh, manifested, things that are not yet real. Fear sees them. But faith also sees them. Faith can see things that are not yet. <laughs> and we can call them as though they were. That is faith. But fear is the other side of this thing. It is the negative side. I, can, I, I could liken it to negative faith. While faith would be positive faith. Because fear, fear sees the worst possibilities and begins to react to the worst possibilities that have not yet taken place. Right now, the world is gripped with fear. It is, it is in a headlock held by fear. But God is saying, do not fear. Don't fear. I am still there with you. God promises his presence. There is no need to be afraid. Fear not. Regardless of what's going on in the world, let us always remember that God is present. God hears us. God knows what's going on. Nothing has taken God by surprise. So fear not. Fear sees the negative. Faith sees the positive. If you are walking through a, a dark alley in the middle of the night, fear begins to imagine that behind that little corner there is a criminal. Fear imagines that someone is carrying a knife. And, and if I keep walking, they, they are going to get me. You have not seen them with your eye, but your fear has seen them, even though they are not there. If, if a floodlight was to light up the place, you would discover that there is nobody. But because fear sees. Once upon a time, I lived in a flat, in an apartment in town. I lived on first floor. And the staircase going upstairs to my floor had no lights. It was very dark. In fact, even the passage had no lights. It was, it was very unsettling to go up those, those steps. And I remember chatting with the family member who gave me an idea. The family member says, listen, when you go up those, those steps, uh, he was telling me this after he himself had gone up those steps and was filled with fear. And he came up with a plan. He says, listen, man, this is simple. When you go up these steps, whoever is hiding along the steps whom you can't see, you need to pretend that you've seen them. So you must start talking to them. So you're going up the steps, you don't see anybody, but you must talk to them as if you've seen them. So he was suggesting, says, when you go up the steps, you must just say, ah, you think I can't see you? I've seen you. Just move from there, I've already seen you. Yet the fact of the matter is, you haven't seen anybody, but it is just your fear that has seen. So fear sees, 
But the beautiful thing is that faith also sees. So while fear sees the worst, embrace your faith. Because faith will say, no, 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 God is with me. He said he'll never forsake me. He will never leave me. God has made that promise. And I will grab it. I will hold it. Why? Because I'm afraid. So I will see the presence of God. So fear sees. And faith also sees. So Moses says, fear not. But that's not all he says. Moses says, stand still. The problem, beloved, a lot of times when we are in crisis, when we are in, um, in fear, is that we will begin to, uh, to move, we will begin to strategize, we'll begin to come up with solutions when God has not inspired those solutions. So Moses says, listen, before you complain and, and decide that you want to go back to Egypt, stand still. Calm down. Calm down. Take it easy, Moses says. Don't panic. Stand still. There are times when God wants to do something for us, and then we take matters into our own hands. It has happened from the beginning of time. Adam and Eve sowed their own uh, figs to cover themselves. Jacob went and cheated his father to try and fulfill the promise that had been made uh, concerning his birth and his brother. So he wanted to take matters into his own hands and he derailed the plan of God for his life for a time. Whenever we are fearful, let us just Stand still. Let us recognize that God is up to something. I've, I've, I've heard them say, when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. So don't fear, stand still. And then this is what the Bible says. After you have stood still, standing still also means that you are to do. When God says stand still and you stand still, that means you are ready to do what God says. How do we know? Because he said, stand still, and you have stood still. So when God says, stand still, and you obey, you do what he says, that is an indication that you are ready to receive the next instruction from God. So that is, that is the attitude that we are to embrace. So don't fear, stand still, be open and receptive to what God has to say. And then finally, Moses says to them, and see the salvation of the Lord. So the other thing that we are to do is to see salvation. Don't fear, stand still, see salvation. How do you see salvation? Recognize the moving of God in your life. Do you know that there are people whom you can ask to say, oh, would you please give us a testimony? And they'll say, e, ah, no, I, do, I, I don't have, e, I've, I've got nothing to share. But the truth, and I had a friend who, who had this challenge. I, I spoke to him, listen, can you give a testimony? And, you know, he, no, I can't, I, mean, I really couldn't, I can't, you know, I can't, I don't have. I said, okay, why don't you come and stand before the people and tell the people that I asked you to give a testimony, but unfortunately you don't have one. You've got nothing to share about what God has done for you. And he says, ah, no, I can't do that. I said, the reason you can't do that is because God has done something for you. All you need is the eye, the discernment to see the salvation, to see what God has done. And that is what we must do. Don't fear, don't panic, stand still, trust him, and then see the salvation of God. Learn to see the hand of God in day-to-day -day life. God, whenever you are asked to share what has God done for you, and then for you, you have to go and retrieve a file from 1965 for you to share what God has done for you, that means there is a neglect of seeing the salvation of God. 
I mean, God is working every day. He woke you up this morning. He got you clothed in your right mind. God has done so much for us. We are where we are because God has led us thus far. God then gives Moses some instructions. Uh, in verse 15, the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Verse 16, But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea. Divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. You remember how the story goes. Moses stretched his rod over the, the Red Sea, and an east wind came, blew, and the sea parted. I wonder how many of the children of Israel were comfortable to walk through the Red Sea. You see, this plan of walking through the Red Sea is a plan that came from God. If God had asked them, right, uh, let's, let's discuss what would you like me to do? They may have been limited by their own uh, knowledge. They might have said, uh, Lord, please build us a bridge across, across the Red Sea. But God is beyond. He is not limited by anything. It reminds me of a, a family that was driving home from church. Father, mother, and their little son. Six-year-old son is sitting at the back, and the father asks him, he says, son, what did you learn today at church? So the son is excited because he learned the story of the children of Israel coming out of Egyptian bondage. So he tells his father, he says, hey, it was so good, dad. We, we were told about the children of Israel, how they came out of Egyptian bondage. Then they came to the Red Sea, and, you know, they were stuck there. Oh, and then what happened? The boy thinks for a moment, and then he says, well, uh, what happened is that uh, uh, some, some, some army helicopters came uh, and with engineers, and they built this uh, makeshift bridge across the Red Sea, a and the children of Israel crossed over on that bridge. And by the time Pharaoh's army came to that bridge, those, those helicopters turned around and they, 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 they shot and demolished those bridges. And so the, the, the Pharaoh's armies were destroyed. The father could not believe what he heard. He says, son, are you sure that's what the teacher told you? He says, well, no, that's not what the teacher said. But I just felt that if I told you really what the teacher said, I thought maybe you wouldn't believe it. What God does can be unbelievable. Why? Because he's not limited. God can make a path through the Red Sea. And so the children of Israel had to, to trust God because it may not have been comfortable for them to walk. Why? Because you are walking on dry ground, but there is a wall of water. There is nothing supporting the water, keeping it at bay. There is nothing keeping the water this side. So human thinking, any minute this water could cave in and we are done. But every step that they took across the Red Sea was a step of faith. They had been filled with fear. They were thinking of going back home going back to bondage. But now they have every single step that they take must be a step of faith. I read an article uh, which suggested that uh, it is true that uh, the exact place where the children of Israel crossed is not known. But archaeologists and historians and you know, theologians who studied this thing have identified a place where they think is most likely. It is not definite, but they think it is likely that the children of Israel crossed here. And the distance from one side of the Red Sea to the other side is 12 miles. 12 miles, I think that's about 19 kilometers. Somewhere there. And so they had to walk across. It has been suggested by these scholars that the population of the children of Israel. In order for them to, to, to walk across that part of the Red Sea, 
it was such that the last person right at the end had to be in within the, those walls of water before the first person came out on the other side. In other words, there was no occasion for somebody to get to the other side and send a message to say, oh, it is safe, you can come. There was nobody who could trust the testimony of somebody else. Each person that was in there was in there by faith. Nobody could say, ah, those guys have crossed. I think it is safe. Let us go. They, each one had to exercise his own faith. The entire nation of Israel, the entire population, at one point, according to these scholars, is likely to have been in the Red Sea at the same time. Beloved, while testimonies, other people's testimonies can strengthen us and can revive our faith, we must exercise our own faith. And we must walk by faith. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. So they couldn't rely on their sight to say, oh, ah, they've made it, let's go. They had to all walk by faith. Every step of the way. That was God's plan. God said, do not fear. Stand still. See the deliverance. Watch what God is going to do. And that's what we are called upon to do today. In the midst of this pandemic, which is affecting the entire world, let us not fear. Let us not fear. Even if I should become infected, let us not fear. If you are infected, let us not fear. God is still in control. God is interested in our faith. The Bible asks a question, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith? It doesn't say when the Son of Man comes, shall he find people living and well? Shall he find faith? God is more interested in our faith because it is faith that we use to transact with God. The Bible says it is impossible. It doesn't say it's difficult. It says it is impossible to please God without faith. You cannot interact with him. You must believe that he is, that he exists. And the moment you believe that he exists, it is faith at work. So let us have faith. Let us discard fear. And let us embrace faith. In these uncertain times, we don't know what the future holds. But we don't need to know what the future holds. It must be enough that we know the one who holds the future. And if we can place our feeble hand in his omnipotent hand, he will walk us through. It doesn't matter what the future holds. We walk with the one who holds the future. May God bless us. And may God be with us. May God revive us. May God strengthen us as we continue to worship together, as we continue to pray for one another, as we continue to see how the world is unfolding. We really don't know what the future holds, but whatever it holds, we have no fear because God is with us. He promised it. We believe it. We accept it by faith. May God bless you, and may God bless the reading of his word today. Amen.